Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. This is episode number 795. My name is Camden Busey. As usual, I'm in Libertyville, Illinois, at the Reform Forum offices, and I'm absolutely delighted, ecstatic really, to have with me today Dr. Greg Beal, who's professor of New Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary in Dallas. Welcome back, Greg. It's so good to see you today. Good to be here. This is your 700. Yeah. And 95th. Yeah. <laughs> Consecutive. We've never missed that's a Friday pretty, by God's grace. That's pretty amazing. Isn't it wild? You don't even look, you don't even look tired. <laughs> that's right. Well, you know, all the all the camera tricks are helping with, <laughs> with that. But uh yeah, since January 2008, we've put out a new episode every Friday. I can't say they're all that good, but uh, there are a lot of good ones in there, and you've been part uh and party of of several of them. So I'm glad to have so you, you back can, today. You can get I'm not, this isn't an advertisement for sure. you, but uh, how, how do you get a hold of uh, those episodes? They're all online, reformedforum.org, all online. Okay. every single one. And you can start browsing. You just go to reformedforum.org. You can browse through the podcast and as far back okay. as you want so to go. The reformedforum.org. You got it. You got okay. it. You're my, you're my, going to be my hype man. <laughs> how do you like that for a natural advertisement? It's pretty good. I, I, you, you, you got to, uh, you know, if you ever need a second career, I think you could get into some uh, online and, and uh, radio marketing. It worked for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people might see that as contradictory to my nature. I probably marketing, marketing for online. But anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> You're exactly. Well, today we're going to be talking about all sorts of fun stuff. But the general topic is the New Testament use of the Old Testament. Of course, uh, Dr. Beal has written a tremendous amount on this, and really, in many ways, has been a pioneer and a, a, a leader of a revitalization, or maybe just a vitalization, <laughs> of this field among evangelicals uh, and particularly in the Reformed world. So I've just got a smattering of books here, just going to hold up to the camera. Of course, you need to get a copy of The Temple and the Church's Mission, which is a biblical theology of the dwelling place of God in the in the famous IVP series. I have here a New Testament biblical theology, tremendous big book. You're going to break my back here carrying all these books around, and you've got the giant uh, commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament, which Dr. Beale co-edited with uh, none other than D.A. Carson. These are just a, a couple. I got so many more books uh, by Dr. Beale on the shelves, but these are in the vein, so to speak, of some of the things we're going to be talking about today. New Testament use of the Old Dr. Hey, Beal, you have a good library there. Well, thank you. Uh, we got a lot of books behind me. You're actually, you actually, you know, on camera. We got a lot of the New Testament, Old Testament, my commentaries. Unfortunately, my uh, my Bart books are right here, so they're just right on camera all the time. Oh, here, I, I, but... I see them, and it's hurting my eyes <laughs> and my right. stomach. Right. Well, at least you and, know. Uh, I did want to tell you this, and the listeners, <laughs> sure, that um, I was just notified by Baker Books. That my forthcoming book, Union with the Resurrected Christ, is uh, they, they've just received the books from the factory, and oh. uh, they're going to send me a complimentary copy today. And uh, uh, so it'll it'll be formally announced here in a week or two that uh, the book is is published. So that's um, amazing. Yeah, it's. Um, um, uh, yeah, I was really encouraged. I, I had the Union with Christ expert Richard Gaffin endorse mm -hmm. it, and uh, so he likes it. So I feel like uh, it must be uh, must be decent, at least going <laughs> going in the right direction. But, well, tell uh, me about the while we're on it. Tell me about the the book, uh, so to speak. Well, that's a what sequel to my New Testament biblical theology. Oh, tremendous! But it's only about five hundred and fifty pages, that's so it, it won't be as heavy <laughs> as the biblical theology. But um, when you write something like that in the in a span of a week, about is it how long it takes you to write a five hundred page book? Yeah, <laughs> sure, no. But um, basically, in the New Testament biblical theology, the central theme was um, that uh, uh, the resurrected Christ is the beginning of the new creational kingdom. Amen. Um, and. Uh, that was part of a storyline. I had a sort of the central part of the storyline. And so what this does is focus on uh, the resurrected Christ and those places in the New Testament where you find, uh, it's not just in Paul, by the way, this is the whole New Testament, where you find a reference to Christ uh, in his ascension mm -hmm. and 
uh, being attributed with something. And then in the same context, the believer is attributed with the same thing in their inaugurated risen position. Yeah. And so, um, uh, uh, m- most union with Christ books or in Christ books, they, they just deal with the phrase or, or whatever. I'm focusing on, uh, the actual explicit references to the resurrection. Yeah. What he's attributed with at his, in his ascended state and what we are. And so I found about 18 or 19 topics or probably more, but wow. 18 or 19. Um, so there are probably maybe that many chapters as well in the book. And, um, so, so it was fun to continue, uh, sort of, um, uh, the, the first book's a presupposition for this one. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it truly is a, a sort of, uh, a sort of sequel. I can't wait to get a copy. I'm going to be making a phone call as soon as I get off the, the call with you. <laughs> I, well, I, I, I figured, you know, I mean, union with Christ is a kind of uh, interest to reform people. Very and, much so. Um, well, I love so, the implication there too, as you you mentioned just in your explanation. Not only union with Christ, who's resurrected, but now ascended. I mean, I'm thinking principally of Colossians three one through four, just how significant that is. I mean, there's so many passages, and again, not just in Paul, but throughout the New Testament. But we have not come to grips with uh, the significance of the fact that our life is with Christ, Galatians two twenty, but not just with Him, but also with Him in the heavenly places. That's a tremendous. And I, at the end of every chapter, I'm, I, I try to be very explicit to have a chapter on so what di- difference does this make for the Christian life Amen. as well. So I try to show this isn't just airy fairy theology. Yeah. And this is Baker theory. Academic, you, you said? Or just Baker? Excuse me? Is this Baker, Baker. Academic? Okay. Yeah, Baker Academic, yeah. yes. Tremendous. Well, we'll take a look yeah. at that. And we are also coming out in the fall. Uh, Don Carson and I, together with Ben Glad and Andy Nacelli, with a dictionary on the New Testament use of the old. Oh, tremendous. And uh, that's that's going to, I mean, if, for example, if you want to know what allegory is, you look it up, it'll tell you what typology is. You look it up, it'll tell you what's the Septuagint. Uh, should we interpret the, uh, uh, should, should we use the interpretive methods that the New Testament writers used, or right. should we not? Don Carson has that essay. I have an essay uh, also. His is the first, mine is actually the second in the dictionary on uh, uh, the presuppositions of the New Testament writers uh, as they interpreted uh, the Old Testament, and and then so on. And so we have a a lot of the um, usual suspects writing other essays as well. Yeah. And so, so yeah, we're very excited about that. Well, we'll have to we'll have to have you back and uh, bring your colleagues with you uh, next time we can talk about these books as soon as they're available for purchase. But I I can't uh, wait. Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. That'd be a lot. Of, I I have to admit I'm really uh, excited about it, and mm-hmm. uh, the essays are just top notch. Yeah. Amen. Well, that's great. Tell me a bit about this conference we have coming up before we get started on our subject. Uh, yeah, we have a conference called. Preaching and Teaching the New Testament Use of the Old Testament for Pastors and Elders. Now, other interested people are welcome to come as well. Um, And uh, what it's going to be is um, to focus not on quotations from the Old Testament, because when someone's preaching or teaching a Sunday school, usually they'll say something about the quotation because it's indented, it's clearly identified. What we're going to focus on are illusions, mm. and we're going to focus. Uh, in fact, we could subtitle the conference "Marginal Theology" because <laughs> I'm going to show people how to use the margins <laughs> of uh, our English Bibles, and especially yeah. the uh, Nesalalan Novum Testamentum Greekum, yeah, twenty uh, eighth edition. Mm. And I'm going to encourage people to buy it, even if they don't know Greek, because the margins are worth the price. Mm. So. Um, uh, so that conference will be in Plano, Texas at the Hope Center mm-hmm. on April 28th, and it'll be an all-day conference, and we're, we're going to be mainly focusing on how do you detect illusions, mm-hmm. because they're sprinkled throughout uh, uh, passages throughout the New Testament. In fact, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but there are more, uh, uh, when you think of references to the Old Testament and the New, most of them are illusions. Yeah. and not quotations. So if you're preaching, 
are teaching a Sunday school or a Bible study and you're not picking up the allusions that are intended by the author, then you're not going to be able to locate your passage as well redemptive historically in the storyline of the Bible. Mm. And it'll help you uh, see how is this author relating this passage back to the Old Testament. It's so important to pick up the allusions. And so um, what we'll do in the conference, we'll have an initial uh, address on why are allusions so important and uh, and, and old and the new in general, but focusing on allusions. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give a, a number of examples of subtle allusions, though, that are intended and, and really uh, 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 tremendously impact the passage. And you wouldn't notice that if you don't pick up on the allusion. Then the second address will be on um, uh, steps or a method to interpret the Old Testament in the New. Once yeah. you find an Old Testament reference, how do you interpret it? Well, I have a nine-step method for that. Hmm. And so I'll, I'll have a message going through uh, uh, an Old Testament uh, allusion, um, uh, and uh, I'll take it step by step, demonstrating how you do it with this, uh, this allusion. And then thirdly, uh, we'll have a message on the different ways the Old Testament's used in the New. There are 12 different ways, you know, like direct prophetic fulfillment, indirect typological fulfillment, or hmm. analogy, right. or an ironic use, and so on. And uh, so, um, and then um, we'll have a workshop uh, where we'll, you know, hand out about a seven or eight page uh, uh, little, some worksheets, and we'll give them a passage, and they'll have to go step by step. Interesting. And, uh, so what we'll do after each step, we'll discuss it. And so they don't do the whole thing, you know, uh, mm -hmm. um, so, so, so we can guide them a little bit yeah, through it. Getting and, feedback. Then, um, and then the final message is uh, finding Christ in the Old Testament, which uh, deals with the debate, is Christ in every verse, or is he just to be seen in the direct messianic prophecies? Yeah. which is, um, you know, uh, a, a debate and that mm -hmm. people have. And so uh, I'm going to be addressing that issue as well. Throughout the conference, it'll be a whole day. There'll be uh, refreshments. There'll be breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And um, and then there'll be uh, uh, question and answer sessions as well after uh, a number of the messages. So, um, so I'm looking forward to it. And um, I think you're going to, after our, our uh, time today, you're, you're going to post uh, yeah, for uh, sure. how to register for the uh, the conference. I see on late. the website they're they're asking people to register by April 10th, 2023. So um, for those listening, uh, we'll have a link to the registration page in the episode description. Again, if you're listening to this uh, this particular episode when it comes out, you'll have time to register. But I encourage you to do this. Uh, the website is uh, Mayor Ministries, M E H R Ministries dot April twenty twenty three. But we'll have a link in the episode description. You can click on it. And again, the subject is preaching and teaching the New Testament use of the Old Testament. It's April twenty eighth, two thousand twenty three, from eight a.m. to nine p.m. It's a full day in Plano, Texas, with Dr. Greg Beal and Dr. Benjamin Glad. And we spoke about this with Dr. Glad a few weeks ago when he was on the program. I wish I could be there. I've got another event that's going to prevent me from coming. But if you ever do it again, you know again, what? Let You're me just know. not committed. I know. I'm not committed. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Well, what are your priorities here? Well, I got to let my yes be yes and my no be no. But if your conference <laughs> would have come up first, it would have been put down on the on the calendar. But unfortunately, it wasn't. Well, that's a so. misapplication of Second Corinthians <laughs> one. Fair enough. We'll let it go there. I need to come to your workshop to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I'm looking forward to this. Um, and I'm I'm looking forward to hearing about it too. And I'm sure that many people will, will love going and will learn a tremendous amount. So there's really nothing quite like this. Have you been part uh, of any event quite like this, the way you've structured it? No, no. I mean, I mean we're, we're intentionally, you know, I just got to thinking, I've been working on this for so many years that uh, something ought to be done um, on, on the pastoral level, you know, mm -hmm. preaching, teaching, New Testament, use the old for pastors and elders. Yes, of course, other interested people in the church and elsewhere are very much welcome. Students are welcome, but we're aiming this, you know, to um, pastors and elders, mm -hmm. so to enhance their ministries. And 
Uh, I don't know of anything else like this. No, no, no one would probably be. Um, uh, a lot of people would think, well, this is just too esoteric of a topic. Oh, no. To, yeah. to relate to the church. <laughs> oh, goodness. This is the lifeblood. Yeah. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm looking forward to you applying this and, and especially the workshop aspect so that people can take this back to their pulpits and enrich uh, their congregations. I was looking forward to uh, talking today and wanted to start off not only with mentioning this conference to set the stage for us, but also to take a little bit of a moment to have maybe a 20-year retrospective. And and I'm curious if you've thought much about this, because I came to seminary in 2007. You know, uh, my alma mater wasn't um, doing so hot in biblical studies back in 07. <laughs> That's so, right. Some That's of these right. issues regarding the Old Testament use of the new and an apostolic so-called hermeneutic, Christotelism versus Christocentrism, etc. Right. These were, this is what I what I got thrown into. And uh, so I had to kind of uh, be be uh, tempered in the fires of some of these debates. And I'm glad things panned out the way they did. And you came- Boy, you did. Oh, goodness. Wow. Well, <laughs> but even prior to that, I mean, we start to look at maybe the 90s and then the early 2000s. This was much more debatable. There's still debates today, but there was a lot more skepticism about typology, biblical theology, about New Testament use of the old. I'm curious, you know, in your storied career, I'm so thankful for the work that you've done over the years, how many books you've written and your involvement at ETS and really offering leadership to Reformed and Evangelical scholars. I'm curious if you've taken a moment, and maybe you would even right now, just to think about where we've come as a church in the last 20 years. How are things different now in terms of people's approach to biblical theology or their openness to it in a more reformed and Christocentric hermeneutic. Have you noticed a big change? Um, what I have noticed is sort of a, a change in um, younger people, uh, of course, seminarians, but also just younger people who have even started their own podcast and mm -hmm. they don't even have seminary training. And, and they're interested in biblical theology. And uh, I think that Don Carson's series, New Studies in Biblical Theology, has been partly responsible for that. I think also those in our uh, Reformed Baptist and Presbyterian seminaries have written on this topic of biblical theology. And we've written at a level that's not purely scholarly, but also isn't purely uh, um, popular. Uh, because people want industrial strength interpretation. Sure. And that's what I'm finding, yeah. uh, especially in relation to how the Testaments relate, because that is at the heart of biblical theology. So again and again, I'm finding podcasts. People will say, hey, could you be on my podcast? And as I talk to them before the podcast, they, you know, they, they just work in the work world. They're, they're not even, uh, mm. they're, they're not seminarians. And, and some are, Um I, I was on a podcast uh, the, the other day. The, the guy is a high school teacher hmm. and um, he has no seminary education. And uh, he is just really in the biblical theology. So, you know, all of our experiences are very selective. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to universalize my experience, but it seems again and again to be happening to me. And it's begun to happen, I would say, in the last, uh, especially last 10 to 15 years that uh, I'm seeing in the church, among people who are not seminarians, among seminarians, and of course then among pastors and elders, a real interest in biblical theology, a real interest in relating the Testaments. Mm -hmm. And um, so again, and I think part of that is obviously uh, not just the writings of various Reformed professors uh, or Carson series, but also I think the... Um, the Gospel Coalition is partly responsible for that as well. And uh, so, um, you know, the new Calvinism, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, well, those are just some of my observations yeah. for why I think there is an increased interest uh, in, in this area. And they, they don't want pablum. They, they really do want what, what I like to call industrial strength interpretation in biblical theology. Mm -hmm. I've noticed a bit more of a convergence 
uh, between the Reformed and evangelical world. I'm happy for that. I still think, you know, obviously a, re- a proper redemptive historical hermeneutic and a Reformed approach to Scripture. We've been, especially us, you know, devotees to Gerhardus Voss and, and Ritterboss and others like that, have been looking at this for quite some time. But it's it's very encouraging for me to see so many new series from Crossway, or you mentioned the BT series from IVP, and, and many other series. There's so many biblical theological resources. It's encouraging uh, to me to see the wider evangelical, conservative evangelical movement uh, coming along and, and being more concerned about these things. I think that's only a good thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, to see university press exactly. with uh, essential studies in biblical theology right. and then Crossway. Yep. Um, Crossway that's more uh, explicitly reformed as a press. Um, uh, also having uh, new studies in biblical theology. Mm-hmm. I think that's just an example of it. The, the, the publishers are realizing, uh, even publishers that, that may not be uh, typically perhaps interested in biblical theology are seeing that it is of interest to many in the evangelical world, and they're starting these kinds of series. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, and, and that's, that's influencing people as well. Have you, how have things, uh, have you noticed any changes or uh, shifts in posture over the years at ETS or SBL? I mean, I know those two are very different. They typically have their meetings uh, kind of back At ETS, back. I, I've noticed the same kind of change. SBL, yeah. that's just a totally <laughs> different animal. That's not, uh, you know, I I think, I think that, uh, uh some of the best uh, seminars at SBL are in textual criticism. Sure. So, uh, um, you know, yeah. but I've noticed this change in ETS. Yes. The same good. change I was talking about. Yeah. That's good to know. Well, I'm glad to in hear fact, that. In fact, it even, it even um, what's happened is that uh, <clears throat> I think that this topic has, ca- has caused people to go back and, and, and look at the Old Testament use of the Old Testament. Because the New Testament writers, as, as people have been doing that, they're, they're saying, hey, the New Testament writers are not doing anything unique mm-hmm. And uh, in terms of, of the interpretive method. Of course, Christ is the key. But even in the Old Testament, I think there was a mesotelic, a mm-hmm. mesotelic hermeneutic, okay? I would call it that. Sure. Uh, I could go into that if you want. But um, <clears throat> so um, I was on a panel just last November at Evangelical Theological Society, and it was on a book that had just been published called Old Testament Use of the Old Testament by a fellow by the name of Gary Snicker. Hmm. And um, uh, and so it was very interesting. Uh, I don't know how the guy did it, but uh, uh, he did this mammoth labor of trying to isolate uh, allusions by later Old Testament writers uh, uh, re- referring to earlier Old right. Testament texts. And it was really, uh, I mean, even does it in the Pentateuch, you know, how does later parts of Genesis interpret the earlier right. parts, for example. Right. So uh, I really recommend that book, uh, Old Testament Use of the Old Testament. And you know what he finds in there? Because this relates to this topic that you were involved in mm. at Westminster, where mm-hmm. you had professors arguing that uh, the New Testament writers did not use the Old Testament in line with uh, its original meaning, right. that they sort of ripped it out, mm-hmm. and um, uh, uh, and, yet, and yet it was still inspired. Uh, I call that te- the right doctrine from the wrong text. <laughs> and um, so uh, uh, what, uh, what Snicker found, which contributes to this debate, even among evangelicals, it's not just between evangelicals and non-evangelicals, that uh, does the New Testament use the Old Testament in line with its original meaning. And Snitger found that the later Old Testament writers, when they use the earlier parts, they do use it to one degree or another significantly in line with the original meaning so that that contributes to this debate, yeah. that uh, that the Old Testament writers did it, and they Precisely. did it contextually. And yeah, it's we, likely the New Testament writers are in line with them. Yeah, we tend to think, uh, regrettably, that there's just like two major historical pieces of the Bible. There's just Old Testament and New Testament. Granted, there's 400 roughly years uh, between the two, but there's there's intertextuality, there's development, there's biblical theology just among the Old Testament books themselves. 
And the, those are spread out over many, many centuries. And, uh, and so the hermeneutic would not be exclusive in this sense, just in terms of New Testament authors using the Old Testament. We should expect that if all scripture is one organic whole inspired by the Lord, that we should be able to find that same type of hermeneutic among older te- Old Testament writers reflecting upon and developing earlier Old Testament writings. In fact, um, you'll find that some New Testament uses of the Old Testament, that uh, that Old Testament text that they're using has already used mm-hmm. an earlier one, or they're referring to an earlier one mm-hmm. that's used by a later one. And if you're not aware of the later text in the Old Testament, then you're going to miss some of the interpretive significance. Wow. Yeah, and it's used in the new. So you, and, and sometimes there might be uh, several uses. Like you take Genesis one twenty eight. Yes, sure. Uh, there's so many uses of that throughout the Old Testament that even at, at, at Wheaton, I know of two dissertations that were written on that, and and there can be many more. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then it's used in in um, the Book of Acts, a reference to Genesis one twenty eight, as well as uh, in Colossians. And so mm-hmm. um, uh, you you've got to be aware of those. Not just Genesis one twenty eight, but the different uses. Mm-hmm. And if you're quoting a use, say from Isaiah, let's say, well, then you got to be aware of the origin of that all the way back, even to Genesis twenty eight. In other words, I, Isaiah fifty four, I believe, verse three uses um, uh, a passage from uh, 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 Genesis twenty eight. But you got to be aware that the origin of that text in Genesis twenty eight is from um, uh, Genesis chapter one. In mm-hmm. verse 28. So, so it's a, you, you got, and, and doing that's doing biblical theology. <laughs> well, that's a question I have for you here. I uh, prompted uh, some folks, uh, knowing that I was going to be speaking with you on the podcast, asked if uh, some folks might have some questions. I got one from Zachary Groff, a friend of mine, uh, Z Groff on Twitter, but he, he's got a really insightful question here for you, and this fits at this moment. He says, I recently heard someone distinguish sharply between biblical theological concerns and intertextual concerns. As a scholar specializing in the New Testament use of the Old Testament, he wants to know what your understanding of the difference or relationship, if any, uh, of either between these two sets of concerns. Let me reword this. He, I suppose he's saying, what is the difference or the relationship between these two things, intertextuality and biblical theology? Um. First of all, intertextuality uh, is a wobbly term. Mm. (laughs) Uh, It it ought to be put in uh, um, sort of italics to make it look wobbly. All right? Yeah. Uh, Because there's philosophical baggage to it Mm. that goes all the way back to literary critics um, in the the 1960s. And it... uh, uh, it can deal with the whole debate about um, uh, can we get at the original meaning of, of a text? And many would say it, it has to do with this whole postmodern perspective that says we have so many presuppositions uh, that we can't, those presuppositions, we have to, we have to read them into uh, what, whatever text we're reading, because that's our only option. We have lenses. If you have green lenses on, you're yeah. going to see green. Yeah. You're going to see green lettering. Okay. And so uh, many would contend that that distorts uh, uh, the meaning of the Old Testament, or um, uh, at least you can't get at that meaning. So um, that's part, you know, that's a debate in and of itself. And, and a number of biblical scholars think that's what's going on, and therefore that's why the New Testament writers, you see, cannot interpret contextually because they have their own lenses. Of course, one of my responses to that is, yeah, guess what their lenses are? <laughs> the lenses of the Old Testament writers. Yeah. And uh, furthermore, the lenses of Jesus. I'll, I'll take both those lenses. Sure. But, um, uh, I mean, this has even infected Christian colleges. Mm. If you go to a, a, a bigger a uh, uh, Christian college, I won't name names, but a bigger Christian college, you take English, uh, a lot of the lectures will be on uh, this idea of um, um, really what, what's called, um, um, let's see. Yeah, well, 
uh, postmodern critical perspectives on whether yeah. you can get at the uh, original meaning. Of. Yeah. It's, it's, it's called sometimes called a reader response perspective. And, um, and so, uh, and then that's then really held by a number of people, typically in our uh, biblical and theological studies departments. This is why people are so interested in the church fathers now, some of the, mm. the, the evangelical scholars, because th they think that the, the church fathers, fathers were involved in allegory, which means reading in ideas to the text, and that, hey, if that was what the fathers did, we need to hold, we need to get back to the great tradition. Yeah, the quadriga. We, get, we need the full and, quadriga. And, and then, uh, so that there, there's, ironically, uh, this this move to postmodernism that's affected uh, evangelicalism uh, has caused some scholars to then be attracted to the fathers to justify their hermeneutical perspective. You see, mm. that's a long explanation for the problem with using intertextual. Now, a lot of people use intertextual merely to say one text is referring to another text. Mm -hmm. It's an inter it's interpreting another text. And that 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 one can actually get at the meaning of that earlier text. So some people use intertextuality in that way, yeah. not with the philosophical baggage. I quit using that term because of the mm -hmm. philosophical confusion. Um, uh, I, I refer to inner biblical exegesis. Okay, I think that's the best way to refer to it. Inner biblical exegesis. Now, if that's what we're talking about, then we're talking about later texts exegeting or interpreting earlier texts. And, uh, and I believe that we can do that. Um, in, in my book on idolatry, um, um, We Become What We Worship, I have an explanation of why I think we can get at the meaning of earlier texts. I, I discuss mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, interact with this postmodern perspective uh, because it has invaded uh, um, evangelicalism. And, and I argue why I think we can get back to uh, the original um, meaning of text. I, I, I contend that it is true, in fact, as a good Vantillian, that we all have presuppositions. But that doesn't mean that we can't uh, uh, see things that are really there in texts, just as if uh, I see a tree. Uh, now, Immanuel Kant said you can't be sure it's a tree. I mean, he, he's partly responsible for this postmodern perspective. But um, I believe that uh, there are some presuppositions that are good and guide us into the truth, as Jesus yeah. said. So um, uh, that's sort of my very brief answer. So I believe that uh, uh, interbiblical exegesis is obviously crucial to biblical theology. And we so also I would not distinguish them as... Uh, uh, your questioner perhaps seemed right. to assume. Well, you could imagine maybe, maybe reading into his co his question a little bit. There's certainly a, a discipline or a study um, that you're going to be addressing in the workshop to some degree, where you're looking at a biblical author's use of text from other parts of the Bible. So yes. whether quoting it or, as you mentioned, identifying allusions. Uh, yeah. There are certain phrases and semantic contexts that yeah. are just part of the biblical author's repertoire, yeah. and by using that, is perhaps we could we could discuss what the purpose of it is. But we do this all the time. Like people quote movies all the time, but what they're doing is they're they're quoting a line, but they're bringing up maybe that scene. You know, you're you're trying to evoke some sort of setting or context yeah. for the purpose for your contemporary purpose, whatever it may be. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, a discipline of that study, and there's also the discipline of biblical theology, as Voss defines it, the history of special revelation. But there seem to be very much over those two concerns very much related, although we might be they able overlap, to- They overlap. Yeah. Yes, they do. In fact, what you're really talking about, you're, you're asking, okay, what is the intention of the later Old Testament author, let's mm. say, using an earlier uh, Old Testament text? Or we could say a New Testament author using an Old Testament. Yeah. What is the intention? And I'm going to have a full address on 12 different ways there we go. an author can intend to use an earlier text. That's tremendous. So all that part of the conference. Um, and do we find 
uh, maybe for those who maybe cannot come, will there be any recordings or maybe some of this material already exists in book there form? There may be, or will uh, be. I think one of the best things they could do, and I don't make probably that much royalty out of it, but my <laughs> book, handbook on the New Testament use oh, of, of the course. Old Testament would yeah, be good. That'd be a great place for that. Because there I have a chapter on steps to interpreting the a new, uh, New Testament use of the old, different ways the New Testament uses the old. I have a chapter on presuppositions of the old and the new, and I yeah. actually have uh, what would amount to a workshop for the last chapter. So hmm. that would be a good one if they can't make it. And by the way, your questioner that just asked me that question, he yeah. may not have assumed that there's a difference between them. I, he, he, he may uh, think they're the same. So I, I don't want to presume on uh, what was behind his, Hey, one way his, or the other. It's an interesting question. I, a I, very good question, by the way. And I, for me, the essence of biblical theology is later biblical texts interpreting earlier biblical texts. Sure. That's the, there's more to it than that, but that's certainly a, a, a huge part of it. Absolutely. This is so fascinating to me, just hearing about this it, it um, and th- to see the development in these disciplines. I, it's encouraging because it's, it's wonderful. We're studying God's Word. We're treating it for what it is, is the very breathed out words of God. Um, But sometimes when we, uh, I don't know, I think people can become a little bit, uh, maybe not depressed, but students can think that there's no, there's nothing new, right? Especially for a confessional person, you can kind of start to feel as if there's no area to be creative or to develop things because everything's already being done. And if you are to go out and develop something new, you're probably departing from uh, the proper way. But here we see that there's, there's so many new vistas. Uh, yeah, to be I able was to just study. having coffee with a uh, fellow yesterday. He's a Reformed Anglican, and um, he was interested in thinking about going to seminary and this sort of thing. But he's done a lot of work in uh, in, in biblical theology, mm-hmm. and um, he, he already has an, an MA in biblical exegesis from Wheaton. Um, but um, uh, he was saying, you know, um, if I decided that I wanted to do a PhD dissertation. Are there any topics left? Exactly. And so um, I said, well, there are, there are. <laughs> um, and I said, a whole huge field is the use of the old and the old. Mm. I said that, that it's been going on for a while, longer than one would think, but it's certainly new compared to New Testament use of the old. And so I said, if you, if you, you want to find something really uh, a new topic, Old in the old would be a good place to to begin to look. It's massive. So any reformed exegetes out there, you think about going to seminary, uh, I, I would say yes. New Testament certainly yeah. important. I, I teach New Testament, but um, uh, if, if I were a student right now, I'd That's focus on Old Testament. And, and if I wanted to do a doctorate, focus on the use of the old and the old. I love because it. There's so much there. And uh, y- you know, we think, oh, everything's been said for the reformed faith. Well, there are many, no. many, many, many uh, contributions still to be made in this area. And by the way, a further comment on why I think that this inner uh, biblical exegesis overlaps with uh, biblical theology is because one of my steps is not only to determine what is the interpretative use of a New Testament writer, that is, is is he indicating fulfillment of a text? Is he indicating typology? Is he indicating an ironic use? Is he indicating uh, an analogy, uh, and so on? Um, one of one of the um, you, uh, steps in in my uh, um, uh, method to interpreting a New Testament use of the old is after you determine the interpretive use, what is the theological use? Yeah, and uh, that that use might be systematic. Hmm. Or it could be biblical theological. And when I say, well, what's the difference between those two? Well, if you look at a systematic theology, you're not going to find Eden as one of the, one of the topics. Mm-hmm. Right. You're not going to find Adam as a priest as right. one of the topics. Right. You're not going to find the Exodus as one of the topics. These are huge biblical theological topics. Enormous. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I tell people, how, how do you become aware of the systematic topics? Well, you go to Bob Inc. or, or you go to Turretin. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe may, may to Burkhoff. So that's what I, you know, I tell <laughs> students. That's condensed Bobbing. content, see how this relates <laughs> to this hermeneutical use. And then, uh, and I said for biblical theological 
subjects. Uh, go go to um, to the uh, dictionary on uh, uh, yeah. biblical theology edited sure. by Rossner. That'd be a good place to look for topics. So, um, but that's the difference yeah. uh, between biblical theological topics and systematic topics. And then it's at that point in the theology where I say, what presupposition underlies the New Testament writers' use of the? I mean, we're into biblical theology at that point. Mm-hmm. I love how uh, we need to be precise and have uh, and understand the distinctions among the different disciplines. You know. Biblical theology, systematic theology, exegetical theology, even church history versus historical theology, you name it. But I think we need to have much more crosstalk among those. And I'm, I'm glad to see that there are fields of study and people engaging in multiple disciplines in pursuit of, you know, a single project, for example. I think it's just By the way, I would tell your audience, uh, by, uh, by Turretin's systematic theology, by oh, yeah. Bobby— uh, get the abbreviation of, of Burkhoff and uh, mm-hmm. because I use them. Yeah. I, you know, n- not that I sit down and read them all the way through uh, when I bought them, but um, I use the scripture index all the time. Yeah. If I'm working on a passage, I'll go to the scripture index. What did Turretin say about this? Right. What did Bobby say about this? It's invaluable. Here's what we need, and maybe this already exists. Maybe Logos has something like this, but we need some master scripture index. <laughs> that just combines, I, even if only existed for, you know, some of our favorites, you know, for me personally, like Voss, Ritterboss, Klein, Gaff, and like uh, yourself, et cetera. And, and just that was had kind a, of you to add me, by the of, way. Well, I, I, I would want <laughs> to know. So, to that magic circle. <laughs> well, hey, you know, Klein, you know, all these guys uh, <laughs> taught with them, studied under them. But um, if you I, know, if Klein we, and I actually overlapped at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary for a couple of years. Yeah, uh, I've been reading. I haven't seen, maybe Danny has, but I haven't been through the entire archive, but we just, the OPC, I I serve as a historian now, but we we just received the Meredith Klein archive, all of his letters and papers. And so we have all sorts of letters that he's written to students, to colleagues, to whatnot, and it's really quite tremendous. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. In fact, yeah. Danny's writing a, a, a commentary. We're going to be publishing this. Effectively, it's a composited commentary on Revelation by Klein. He's com- he's taken all of Klein's writings on Revelation and put them together in a in a quite interesting I don't know, it's not provocative, but it's a really compelling little project. We'll have to yeah. send it over to you. Very exciting. Yeah. Is Hendrickson doing that or no, is we are. your perform forum? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're Super. excited. Well, about I know that. That, that, that Jonathan Klein, yes. you know, is the head editor at Hendrickson. So and I, he and did, he's published yes. some of his father's writings. Genesis. Right. He's yeah, exactly. And uh, it's very, very useful. I'm very thankful for that. Um, wanted to ask you some more uh, questions on this subject. I'm glad you're able to talk about some of your suggestions for. Uh, so so far, you're throwing me softballs. I know. I don't. Well, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm, a, I'm just a systematic theologian here and dabbles you know in history. I don't know anything about the. I enjoy the, Bible, the softballs, <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> well, I keep a, a file myself uh, in my notes. I'll, I, I won't get into the weeds of the way I take my notes, but it's uh, some people out there uh, have listened to some other episodes I've done on my uh, note taking system and all sorts of stuff. But anyway, one thing I do is I keep a running track of research questions that either I would like to pick up myself or would like someone else to do. You know, I basically think of if I if I'm reading books and wondering if something is the case, I'll have a whole file of books I would like to exist or books I would like to read that do not yet exist. I'm wondering, you know, in addition to the Old Testament wow. use of the Old Testament, do you have such a even if it's a mental file? Uh, that you draw on when you're thinking about books you want to write, or perhaps when you're advising PhD students and giving them suggestions. Oh, you know, you know, a number of years ago, I had a file for dissertation topics. Did you? I did, and the topics I wanted to do. Yeah. And so when I went to Wheaton, we started a doctoral program. Uh, that was ten years. I continued to teach doctoral students at Westminster for eleven years. So out. I- over 21 years, um, I exhausted my list. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, these All were gone. books I wanted to write. 
And so I decided, you know what? I don't have time to write it. I'm going to get my student to write it. Yeah, yeah. And so the good thing about that is the professor stays involved. Right. Instead of the student offering some proposal that the professor's not interested in. And I found that when a student followed my advice and took a subject that I gave them, uh, usually it, it was publishable. Good. And uh, so uh, that was very exciting. But yeah, I still uh, I still have topics or topics that, that I am going to write on. One's yeah. a, a biblical theology of the wilderness. Oh, and um, I'm contracted to do that in the new, t- new, oh. new studies for biblical theology. I've been and, doing work on that, but for just you know, uh, not for, not for scholarly pursuits, but for my, I'm, I'm a, I love hunting and the, the outdoors. So I've actually been reading about biblical theology of the wilderness with regard to like American reception of the wilderness and interaction with the frontier and whatnot. It's quite, it's quite fascinating from an historical perspective, just thinking about how American Christians have thought about the wilderness because of the biblical background and how yeah. that affected their perception of what the frontier was and the people like Native Americans of the frontier and how they ought to be treated as inhabitants of that wilderness. It's tremendous. It goes back. You got to write a book on American reception history of the, the Exodus and the Bible, the wilderness. I, I, I might have to because <laughs> uh, this is an important topic. Yeah, another book that I really wanted to write because there has been one written on it and I, I wasn't um, – uh, I think much more can be said, and I'm, I'm doing a uh, a book on the use of the Old Testament in Ephesians. No, oh, yeah, sure. So um, I'm looking forward to that. That that that, that will be with um, Lexham Press. Oh, great! That's great. Um, <clears throat> but other than that, I, I have a million and one topics uh, of the use of the old and the old. Mm. That's just such a huge area, and if uh, again, people that might want to do a master's thesis, a THM mm-hmm. thesis, or doctoral dissertation. That's that's the area to go investigate, you know, because mm-hmm. I'm convinced it's so crucial for New Testament use of the old hermeneutics. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to reading more studies on that myself once they exist. But let's put that out as an encouragement to uh, students looking yeah. for things to do. Yeah, and again, it, it, it really uh, does speak to this postmodern idea of radical reader response criticism where again you know new testament writers are reading in their own presuppositions mm. to old testament texts well if the new testament writers have the same presuppositions as the old testament writers then they're not reading in their presuppositions <laughs> sure <laughs> it's great <laughs> it is it's really nice to have a single primary author of scripture it's nice when that works out that way with the opportunities Here's a bigger question for you a little bit coming back to the workshop, but it's something that comes up a lot, especially when we're talking about preaching and an approach to the text. It's a bit of a debatable point, so this is an open-ended question, but I want to ask you your thoughts on hermeneutics and homiletics. Uh, Do you distinguish between the two? And how, if so, how do those two relate in your mind? Uh, For example, do you think that a specific hermeneutic demands a specific type of homiletic or another potential option does a specific hermeneutic it can it po- potentially be satisfied by different homiletic approaches hey, what are your thoughts on that okay my thoughts again are very nuts and bolts mm-hmm. you know uh, let me start off by saying if you took take a hermeneutics course in seminary it usually is going to be either of one type or another type that is, it's either going to be more theoretical on uh, philosophy, uh, on hermeneutical theories, a rate of response or criticism, for example, and, and so on, uh, on semantics. Uh, or you can have a hermeneutics course that's nuts and bolts that sure. basically teaches you, okay, here are the principles of exegesis. Now we're going to start practicing that for the rest of the semester on different biblical texts, and I'm going to grade your assignments, and we're going to go from there. So right. those are two different approaches. So my answer to your question is a nuts and bolts answer, Yeah, and because that's the way I teach my hermeneutics course. And so uh, here's my answer. My method uh, for interpreting use of the old and the new starts out with, number one, what's the New Testament context of the quotation or allusion? Number two, What's the Old Testament context for where that quotation occurs? Number three, 
How did early Judaism use it? Number four, let's compare the text and see what text is the New Testament writer using. Is he using the Hebrew? Is he using the Greek Old Testament? Is he using some variants uh, of either two of those? Is he using the Aramaic Targum? Is he using an early Jewish tradition? Is he using a Qumran version of the Old Testament? And so on. And then you, you, you put those texts up in different columns. You put the New Testament texts up, obviously in Greek, and you start underlining and say, okay, which text is the writer using? Mm. Sometimes it's very clear the writer's using uh, the Hebrew as opposed mm. to the uh, Greek Old Testament. Sometimes it's clear he's using the Greek Old Testament. And so then the next step, this is step five, is why mm. is the New Testament writer, for example, using the Greek Old Testament? And then the next step, um, uh, I think those were steps, let's see, five, six, seven. Anyway, but roughly around step number seven <laughs> is sure. what, what is the hermeneutical use of the Old Testament? Uh -huh. uh, that is, what, what's his intention is to, to indicate direct fulfillment, typology, analogy, irony? And step number eight is theological use, and the last step, in the light of everything, you want to ask, what's the rhetorical use? Mm. Because that, that is a, a, a very serious area of study in Old and New Testament studies today, rhetoric. You know, what's the rhetorical use? But all that means is, how what is the writer trying to persuade the readers about? That's rhetoric. And so in the ancient world, uh, rhetoricians, if they were skilled, they could persuade people to their point of view very skillfully, okay, in, in the speech. Absolutely. So how is the New Testament writer... It was a writer, sport. How is the New Testament writer trying to persuade the readers in Galatia yeah. or in, um, uh, in, in Ephesus, etc.? Uh, and so typically, and, and, and there's much more than this, but typically is he trying to... Uh, get them to adopt a certain uh, kind of behavior uh, that they need to adopt? Or is he trying to get them to adopt or revise a, a certain theological idea? Um, and, and so on. So, I mean, and, and, and there's there's more you can ask there, but that's preaching. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's so, so you, now you're saying, I mean, you could call this, when, when I took Old in the New in seminary, from my uh, one of my, my old and the new mentor, uh, he called this step pastoral application, mm -hmm. and um, I call it uh, rhetorical use. But right. they're the same. So, so that's that's my basic nuts and bolts answer to your question. Sure, but just but I guess to go a step further, there are many different styles of preaching, and I think people have debates over different styles or different homiletic approaches. For example, Puritan plain style versus redemptive historical style, etc. I tend to think redemptive historical preaching is based on a redemptive historical hermeneutic. But given the passage, given the personality and skill of the preacher, given the needs of a particular congregation, perhaps there could be different homiletical approaches in a given scenario provided they're addressing the and accurately conveying the point of the text and its Christo, Christocentric and Christotelic focus. You know what I'm saying? So you give you could have two people that are espousing a similar or even an identical hermeneutic, but if you put them in a various in various preaching contexts, the sermons might be presented in very different ways, but still convey the accurate meaning of the text. It's just a perplexing thing to me, uh, and thinking well, about I, I, homiletical freedom. Yeah, I know freedom. what you're saying. I know what you're saying, and and I, I'm probably pretty naive uh, in the way I'm going to answer. <laughs> but um, I, I believe that while it's important for a pastor to know the needs of their congregation, and as they get out and visit with them, they yeah. will. But I think if you try to preach toward the needs of a congregation, you're inevitably going to leave out some people. Oh, sure. And so I, so I, I, I just contend right. you preach right. what the text says, and uh, sometimes you might want to aim it, you know, uh, if, if there's a, you know, pretty massive problem in the congregation, maybe yeah. aim it to that. But, but generally, God will use his word to speak to all the various needs of people. The same word will speak to various needs. Absolutely. And so um, that, that, that's my naive uh 
perspective. I'm, I hear you. I'm, I, yes, I do want to know the needs of the congregation, but in terms of preaching, I think you have to be careful about aiming towards, you know, well, I know there are three couples that have a marriage problems, and so I'm going to have a, a, a marriage illustration for my, or a marriage application for yeah. my uh, my passage. And sometimes that can get you in trouble because it may only be uh, t- two people that have that problem. They know you're <laughs> preaching to them, but at any rate. Um, so, sure. uh, well, you've been a pastor, so you you uh, know this better than, uh, than, than I do. I've only been an interim preacher for couple of times sure so i don't have quite the experience that you have well it's an interesting thing to to discuss perhaps we'll have to pick back up and and uh present the question i love i love talking about it it's been really helpful i wanted yeah. to ask you some other questions a little bit off the beaten path just in our remaining time one of your former uh students uh ben glad he's a friend of the show we like to say whenever he's on yeah. the program i have just the best time talking to him we really enjoy one another. If he doesn't enjoy his time with me, then he's the world's best actor. He should get a, a an Oscar. <laughs> but uh, anyway, one thing we like you doing. Know, he's, uh, he he was a former student of mine right. in the Masters of Biblical Exegesis program in Wheaton, and then I was his doctoral supervisor at Wheaton. Yeah. And we have co we have co-authored books together. I know it's great to see that. Uh, you know, in sports and football, they call it, they always talk about the uh, coaching tree. You know, and so you'll have a head coach and they have assistant coaches who go off to do other things and sometimes they come back, but it to you know, the measure of a of a great coach is not only their success on the field, but the success of all the people that have served on their staff. And I think if there's an analogy, I think your your academic tree is quite impressive and Ben Glad is uh, is certainly a testimony to that. So we praise God for that. That's uh, the work of the Lord. Amen. And we're thankful for that. But one Amen. thing I love talking to Ben about, we uh, get a kick out of this is talking about tips and tricks and and uh research methods and stuff. Some people that listen to this program love to get into the weeds as you mentioned nuts and bolts. They want to know how things are done. No matter how pedestrian or how how basic or uninteresting this might seem to you, Dr. Beal, some of these things are going to seem very interesting to our listeners. So I'm wondering if you could walk us through, let's say you're going to exegete a passage. Like, how do you approach that? Nuts and bolts. Like, what what Bible do you open up? What version is it? Uh, is it paper? Is it electronic? Do you start taking notes? I mean, what what's that look like to you? Just an actual nuts and bolts, tools, methods. How do you approach a text, and and uh, how do you study it? Okay, if I'm uh, preaching a text and I haven't preached it before, I'm preparing a sermon or a Bible study, or if I'm writing a commentary, um, I'll take a paragraph of text. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's say First uh, Timothy. Five, nine to, um, I believe, 16 or 17 concludes the widow section. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I won't look at commentaries first because I have enough presuppositions of my own yeah. that, that, that might distort the text, uh, than getting other presuppositions first. So, uh, I look at it myself and, um, Sorry to interrupt, but are you looking at a paper Bible? Like, what are you actually using when you're pulling a text? You Both. Sometimes I look at paper. Sometimes I look at uh, my accordance. Accordance. Okay, great. Thanks. It, it, it varies. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I have my bi- English Bible always open, and then I'll have accordance with the Greek open on the screen. Mm-hmm. And, um, <clears throat> and so... Uh, the first thing that, that that I will do is to ask myself, what is there any historical background here? Um, and, uh, and I'll look at that in general, might read a Bible dictionary. Let's say I'm doing um, uh, Thessalonians and I'm starting that. So I'll, I'll look at a dictionary article on Thessalonica, look at its economy, its government, um, um, and, and, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And... Um, just see if there's anything interesting there. Uh, and, and then what I'll do, I'll, I'll focus in specifically, what's the occasion of the letter? I'll just read it through. So who's it written to? Is there a problem that Paul seems to be addressing? So just to get the framework and and obviously the outline, uh, I'll, do, I'll do an outline of the book. 
Um, and if I don't have time to do an outline, let's say I'm doing, I'm preaching, let's say, and I'm, I've chosen the passage and, uh, well, I'll get a very good commentary and look at their outline just to situate my paragraph. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, after I've done that, then, um, uh, I'll translate the text in Greek mm -hmm. and for seminary students, I tell them, you know, go on and have your English Bible there, but translate it in Greek. What just Greek version? I'm, now, I'm gonna I'm gonna know. ask the details. What Greek version do you use? Do you do this by hand when you're translating? I, I, I do. I, I use the Nesalalan, uh, a blue uh, one, or a... uh, Novum Testament yeah. Greek. Okay. Uh, In... Twenty twenty uh, eighth edition edition of Nesalalan. You just have that, that sitting on that's... your desk there, and you just yes. work through it yes. and write out in English. Now basically, I have in front of me a desk. To yes. the left of me. I have a library stand that has books on it. Beautiful. And to the right of me, yes. I have I, I have it. So I'm in the Ben Glad calls it the cockpit. Yeah, hey, okay. that's good. You're a maverick. <laughs> so um and you can see behind me I have yes. books. These are all my actually I'm in the Holy of Holies right now. <laughs> this is a small study. Yeah. Outside is a bigger study with all my books. In fact, I, I sometimes teach classes here with nine or ten oh, students. Okay. And that's the holy place. And so, and not I, only I, the chief, I, the chief books can enter into the most holy place, but once the, the, but the once books, the tools that I use, <laughs> right. lexicons and uh, Old Testament background stuff, et cetera, et cetera, are in the holy of holies. And there's it. a holy place, and and then outside is a big lawn area, uh, <laughs> and that's that's the uh, that's the court the courtyard. So <laughs> that's anyway, where you play jarts. So, yeah, but sure. but so so I got background number one. Um, and, and then uh, there are two kinds of that background, broad and specific of the book itself. And then I'll translate it. And then at that point, what I'm going to do is after I translate, I'm going to read different English translations, seven or eight of them. Okay. And I'll do that on accordance. Got perfect I use of that. Real quickly. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm going to click that real quickly. So, and I can see what they say. And um, where those English translations differ is usually where the exegetical problem is. And so I tell students, look, you want a commentary on uh, where the interpretive problems are in your text? Compare the English translations. Perfect. That's a and perfect I, idea. Now, sometimes you have to be careful right? because some translators will introduce a problem that never was there. So you have to be aware <laughs> of that. But usually they're... Uh, where they differ, their problem. So they'll translate a word differently, or they'll translate a construction like love of God differently. Some will say love for God. Some will say uh, love by God. Some will say divine love. Yeah. And some will say leave it as love of God. Let God's it be a love. pregnant yeah. genitive. Exactly. And so, um, and, and so on. And so uh, then the, the, the third uh, step is textual criticism. Um, it may be that the translations differed because uh, some manuscripts said one thing and some said another. So I'll deal with that to see what was the original reading. And um, then uh, fourth step, I'll look, is there a grammatical problem? Is there a problem with just one word? Um, and then uh, uh, I guess I'm on the fifth step. I, I'm losing numbers here. <laughs> but the fifth step, is there a syntactical problem? So sy syntax is like, how do words relate? How does God relate to love and love of God? Okay. Yeah. That's syntax. Yeah. Sixth step, is there a logical relationship problem? Now, this is the one of the most important for so me. discourse analysis? Yes, I yeah. do discourse analysis. I introduced that at Westminster. Yeah. Uh, Vern Poitras did a little bit before right. I came, but that, that became kind of the the heart of my my, my teaching of hermeneutics. And so that is a procedure whereby you take your paragraph, you divide it into its constituent propositions. Sometimes a verse might be two propositions, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and what you do is I have a procedure by where, whereby you can trace the development of thought and find the main point. Now, that's pretty important for preaching. Yeah. If you're going to preach, it'd be nice to know where the main point is, okay? Yeah. And also, if you're uh, uh, writing a commentary, hey, that would be nice. So that's number six. Um, number seven, I look at, uh, are, are there, I look, use the margins. Are there any New Testament parallels mm -hmm. I need to look at here that enlighten this text, that cause a problem for this text? And then eighth, how about Old Testament and the New? What Old Testament parallels are here? Is it a quotation? Is it an allusion? 
let's look in the marginal decimal line to see if it's an illusion. Mm. Or let's look at our other margins of the English text to see, is that an illusion? And number nine, is there a theological problem in this text? Number 10, is there a figurative problem in this text? For that, you go to Bollinger's figures of speech used in the Bible. There's a scripture index, not exhaustive, but useful. And maybe your text will be there, and it'll yeah. give you, is this a synecdoche? Uh, is this a hypocatastasis? Is this a metonymy? And what are those anyway? He'll define them and tell you what difference it makes. Yeah. Um, and then uh, n- n- number 10, consult the commentaries. Mm-hmm. Now you now you, you you have an idea of your text and you can evaluate. Is this what is the commentator writer telling me something that's really helpful here that I don't know? Yeah. Or is the is the writer really off base? Usually, believe it or not, you can tell that. What are you doing along the way as you're doing each of these steps? Are you taking notes somewhere so that you're writing, jotting things down? Are you building a a document, a file as you go, or are you just tucking this away in your mind? I go through this method. I take one verse at a time and go through all 10 steps. Oh, interesting. But are you writing this in a Word document or on paper? Okay. Word document. Got it. Do you... uh, Hmm. So I'm starting to write a commentary, actually, in uh, uh, as I go through these steps. I start, or, or a sermon, yeah, or whatever. Sure, sure, sure. So um, ba- basically, for a sermon, I would basically start just writing a commentary. Yeah, okay? of course. For myself, then I turn that into a sermon. So um, as I go through these steps, I'm beginning to write on that verse and what it means. That makes total sense. Interesting. What do you do after your final product is done, whether that's, you know, a chapter for a, a commentary or a sermon? Do you file these notes away somewhere? Do you scan them? Do you toss them? Do you give them, you know, give them to your dog to chew on? Or what <laughs> What do you What do you do with the material? Well, actually, you think you're done? joking in that last yeah. comment. <laughs> uh, in my devotions, I used to, as a part of them, would be the Book of Common Prayer. For, and it was my wife bought it for me. It was leather bound. And it was from like uh, 1880. Oh, no. And, uh, and, and then a few years ago, we got a dog that was half Great Pyrenees and half yeah. um, Lab, and he ate up my... Uh, Psalm 22? <laughs> um, at any rate. Now now it's it was recovered, and I have a rubber band around it, but I, I really can't read much of it. Well, I want to know if his tooth marks penetrated to Psalm 22 or not, uh, with the dog surrounding <laughs> Basically, I was preaching a sermon the, once, the literally. The dog was more <laughs> concerned about the taste of the leather binding. <laughs> so. That's something else. I was preaching. Uh, we had an evening service in in someone's home once. I was doing pulpit supply. So at this church, uh, it was a church plant. In the morning service, they rented a place. But in the, for the evening service on the Lord's Day, they would usually meet in someone's home. So I was preaching and doing an Old Testament uh, scripture reading. In, in tandem with the sermon text I was going to be preaching. And I got to that psalm and I literally was reading this, you know, and, and uh, saying, you know, dogs surround me. And literally the lady's <laughs> dog ran through <laughs> through the service in the living room, right brushed by my leg, right as I read that verse. And I thought, oh my is, God, <laughs> is, is there ever, hey, it wasn't a providential, a, <laughs> providential illustration. Exactly. Can't get better than that. This dog was friendly so, at um, least. <laughs> So, yeah, what I do is I just store them on my computer because I, I don't write them out longhand on paper I see. as I used to do. Yeah. I still, uh, and, and by the way, um, with lectures, with sermons, I do the best work I can. Okay. And so that if I want to use it again, all I have to do is do some revision. Yeah. Some people who say, I'm going to throw the sermon away. And then 10 years when I preach it again or seven, I'm going to do a new sermon. I, I, I am not that way. I feel like if I put good effort into the exegesis of this text, right. I want to say use the it again. result of that effort. Now, I might want to change it. I might want to add some illustrations or applications. Maybe I want to you know, make it shorter, whatever, you know. I, I do the same thing uh, similarly. Of course, I don't uh, publish much. I've, I've written a few journal articles on biblical studies and whatnot. But even if I'm working on a sermon and I'm using a source, I, I, I take the extra time. I do all my full documentation. I use a citation manager and everything. So I make sure that nothing gets into even a sermon of mine that isn't, doesn't have scholarly documentation. 
Because yeah. I don't know, I might want to use that for an article someday. I might want to backtrack yeah. my work and find out where where some of these ideas came from. Very wise, because I, I know uh, some biblical scholars who, uh, when they started lecturing when they were young, yeah. they did not footnote sources in their lectures. As they got older, they wrote commentaries on those books exactly. they were lecturing from, and they got in trouble. because You could plagiarize were- accidentally. Yeah, They were seen as plagiarizing, but they right. weren't intending to do so. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter, but you're right. That's, that's a, that's a, um, there's a difference, but um, it's important that, that everyone, even, even if you're not planning to publish something, it's always yeah. good to document your sources, even for your own use, your own future use. It's a good thing. And sometimes do. in the sermon, you, you, you know, you say, well, as, as, as of course, uh, J.I. Packer said, or right. whatever. And you don't now, need you to may give not the page always number. Say, you may say uh, 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 one preacher has said this, of course. or et cetera. Um, right. You know. Yeah, they, we don't need to give full, full, uh, you know, Turabian no. uh, citations during the sermon, but no. But if you it's having nice them have. somewhere is important <laughs> yeah. for your own benefit. This has been so fun. I store I store them on my computer, okay. and uh, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I probably need to organize my files on my computer a little better before I die so that someone like Ben Glad can retrieve them and do something better with them. Well, we might, you know, I, I hope it's many years from now, but uh, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, or I, I really hope the Lord just comes back right now. That'd be the best case scenario. But if he doesn't, I still think maybe you've got enough files on that computer that we're going to be reading uh, Dr. Greg Beal books for a long, long time. Uh, edited by Ben Glad or or someone else in your <laughs> academic tree. <laughs> Who knows? Oh, Dr. Beal, I don't want to keep you any longer. I would love to talk to you all day. Uh, maybe another time we can, but this is, I've already kept you for more than an hour. So thank you so much yeah. for taking the time today. This is always, it's always a privilege, but it's been a joy for me today to speak with you. No, I appreciate the questions. They were, they were very good methodological <laughs> questions. And then actually, I, I think important questions. So Thanks for uh, thanks for asking me. You're most welcome. And again, I'll have information about the upcoming conference. It's April 28th. Uh, registration deadline, I believe, is April 10th. No matter when you're listening to this, just know we're in the year 2023. I know five, ten years from now, somebody will be listening to this and then try to <laughs> register for the conference. It already happened. But if you want to learn more about preaching and teaching the New Testament use of the Old Testament and get hands-on experience and feedback in person, and this is the place to go. It's in Plano, Texas, April 28th, 2023. All and the it's, info is online. Uh, it's sponsored uh, by three organizations, Reform Theological Seminary, the Mayor Reform mm. Ministries, which is a, a Middle Eastern kind of a ministry, mm. especially to Iran and Lebanon Yes, uh, for Reform Theology. And then there, uh, a church uh, that I attend is sponsoring it called Town North PCA, Wonderful. Presbyterian Church of America that's in Richardson, Texas. So. Well, that's great. I'd love to hear that. It's a great place to go in April, too, especially if you're up here in the north where I am. That's uh, right. A place it's, to get out. Have you gotten much snow this winter? It's, uh, yeah, a good amount. Um, you know, you, you've lived in Wheaton. You know you know what can happen up here. And the people in Minnesota are, don't even uh, like us Illinoisans talking about our snow. But it's melted today, but who knows what's going to come in the future. But, that's for sure. Texas, well, Kahneman, it's been, uh, been really good to talk to you. I'm glad you could take some time to uh, talk to me. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. I want to point everyone to the website. You head on over to reformedforum.org. You'll find information about all of our programs, upcoming events, and our online courses, all available for free to anyone around the world. But I do want to thank everyone for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.